Um, and so now we're getting recorded. Was I was just informed. Everyone, everyone heard that. Everyone, was... okay. So believe it or not, in Madison, he said. And when he said Madison, I was like, ha ha. Mm -hmm. um, that's a unique chance. Um, when he's in Madison, I will make sure that he's connected with our center. I then in that day, the Luba Institute, he and I became friends. We're friends now for many years. And I'm very happy um, that I can present to you uh, tonight, um, Professor Emeritus Paul Nitter. And I can not just present him as someone who holds a lecture, but I am especially um, uh, happy that he will lead us today um, in contemplative traditions. He will help us to explore something we said we would do for a while, um, explore contemplative tradition, spirituality, meditation, um, and will give us a chance um, to talk about that experience a little bit. And I'm very happy that he's here. So, um, hello, Paul. Um, good to have you here. And um, David, if you want to say a few more words, I let you do that. And if not, I would say let's uh, move it over to Paul. Um, and everyone, please, <laughs> we want to welcome our guest tonight. Oh, and I shouldn't forget, he's also an honorary fellow of our center. Yes, so yes. <laughs> I was able to do that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, OK, thank you, David, and then Paul. Yeah, I'll, I'll just say I, I, I read uh, your book, Without Buddha, I Could Not Be a Christian, when I was um, like a junior or senior at UW. And so um, it had, a, had an effect on me. And um, I'm, yeah, I don't know, humbled and honored that you're, you're coming to, to, to teach us. And so uh, I, I know I'll, I'll enjoy this talk a lot. So looking forward to it. Thanks, Paul. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and hello, everyone. Um, I, I know our time is very limited, but, um, and I didn't check this out beforehand, David, can we just very quickly, um, I just, just to hear a word from each of the students, your name, or maybe where you're from, if, do, you, do we have the time to do that, do you think, David? Uh, yes, yeah, if you'd like, yeah, sure. I, um, and it is there some personal connection that way, and not that I'll remember your name. At my age, I don't do names anymore. Um, but uh, um, maybe we, we, we can if you just um, one after the, I mean, I, I, I see you on my screen. So why don't I, if, if, you, if, if it's okay, I'll just uh, call the first name. And if you could just say your name, uh, where you're from, and, and maybe if you have a major, um, uh, th that will give me a little sense of who you are. So right to my, to my uh, left of the screen is Maya. Hi, my name is Maya. Um, I am from Verona, which is like 20 minutes from Madison, and I study Russian literature and international oh. studies. So ah. thanks for being here today. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, Ben? Hi, I'm Ben. I'm from Whitefish Bay, Wisconsin. It's a suburb of Milwaukee, oh. and my majors are math and religious studies. Math and religion. <laughs> Great combination. Great. Thank you, Ben. Uh, Grace Margaret? Um, hi, my name is Grace. I'm from Green Bay, Wisconsin, originally, um, and I'm studying social work. Uh, Green Bay, great city. My wife was born in Green Bay, so that's what, good. Anna or Anna? I'm Anna, and I'm from Cedarburg, Wisconsin, which is kind of near Milwaukee, and my major is journalism, and I am going for a certificate in religious studies. Oh, good. Okay, thank you, Anna. And uh, uh, Danny. Hi, I'm Danny. Um, I grew up in Madison and I study community and nonprofit leadership and history. Okay, good. Thank you, Danny. Uh, uh, Anusha? Hi, uh, I'm Anusha. I am from St. Louis, Missouri, Thanks. and my major is health promotion, health equity. Very good. Thank you. Erin? Uh, Hi, um, I'm Erin. My I'm also from St. Louis, Missouri, and oh. I'm majoring in English, communications, and political science. Very good. Thank you. And um, Azaria, or if I is it Azaria or Azaria? Help me. Uh, Azaria. Azaria. Um, I'm from same place as Ben, Whitefish Bay, and I'm a French and Spanish major. Oh, very good. Thank you. Uh, Cal Floyd. 
Hey, yeah. Uh, my name's Cal. I'm from Ann Arbor, Michigan, and I'm studying history, environmental studies, and European studies. And Amy. Hi, I'm Amy. Um, I'm from Menominee Falls, Wisconsin, which is oh. half an hour outside of Milwaukee, oh, and I'm okay. studying neurobiology. Thank you for being here. Yeah. Okay, welcome. Thank you, Amy. And Laura? Hi, my name is Laura, and I was born in Colombia, but I've lived in Madison most of my life. I study environmental engineering and French. Great. Laura, if I may ask, where in Colombia? Cali. Cali, okay, good. Mm -hmm. okay. Have you been? Uh, yes, I taught at the Javeriana some years back in Bogota oh, for a while. Oh, nice. Yeah, I hope you liked yeah. it. <laughs> I loved it. I loved it. Uh, Bryce. Hello, my name is Bryce. I am from a small town in northern Wisconsin, and I study Russian and criminal justice. Very good. I'm not that I would know. What's the small town? Uh, Mellon. It's about 500 people, so it's pretty small. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Bryce. And um, Simran. Hi, I'm Simran. I'm from Madison, and I study biology. Biology. Very good. Thank you, Ethan. Hi, I'm Ethan. I'm from Mineral Point, Wisconsin, and Hi. I study I study English literature with a certificate in European studies. Okay, very good. Thank you, Ethan. And Jacob. Hi, I'm Jake. I'm from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm a microbiome major. Very good, Jacob. Thank you. And I from is it Milan or Milan? Yeah, it's Milan. Um, I am also from Minneapolis, Minnesota, and I'm also a microbiome major, which is a really weird coincidence. <laughs> okay, good. And Mukadas? Mukadas? Uh, Mukadas, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, I'm Mukadas, and currently I'm in Pewaukee, and I am studying psychology. Very good. Thank you. Well, um, thank you all. And uh, I, and and I thank you to to Uli, our Professor Rosenhagen, and 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 David for uh, for this opportunity to, to be with you. I've been retired for a while, and it's always it's always good to be back in the classroom, even though it's a virtual classroom. So I'd like to um, so our topic is exploring contemplative traditions. Uh, I'd like to make some some preliminary remarks, kind of introductory remarks. Um, and then, as I've um, discussed it with David and Uli, um, then we'll actually do a little bit of contemplative practice together. And I hope that's, that's everybody would be comfortable with that. Um, um, so that's the, that's the program and making sure that we have some time at the end um, to, uh, to talk with each other, to, to exchange our views on what, on what we thought um, and what we felt. In this um, in this e this evening, so I am now going to try to um, get onto shared screen so that I could um, have a very simple PowerPoint point outline of the points I'm going to be making. That'll make it a little bit easier for you to um, to fo to follow. Um, okay. Tell me. Okay. Um, all right, now, um, can you see that? Um, I want to get into the slideshow. Okay, can everybody see that? We're doing, okay, great, thank you. So anyway, there's the, there's the topic, exploring, exploring contemplative traditions. I'd like to start out with just a couple of comments um, on, the value, and I would even want to say the, the necessity of interreligious dialogue or interreligious engagement, or the value and the need for people who, who define themselves as religious to talk to each other. Um, and and I'd, I would um, first, a general reason, a couple of reasons why I think this is valuable, if, if not even necessary. If you kind of look on the, the object of religion or the goal of religion, namely, what is the meaning of life? Or what is, is there, is there an, some kind of an ultimate reality that grounds 
our own finite reality. Um, big, big questions. And each of the religious traditions feel that they have, have had a history of experiencing that. And so they are, I'd like to, co to compare religions to telescopes um, to, by which we can explore this universe of, of truth, um, of putative divine reality. But as with any telescope, a telescope enables you to see something out there in the vast universe, the vast universe of truth. Um, and without them, you probably you couldn't really get a, a, a satisfying understanding of, of the vastness of truth. So they enable us to see, but they also limit us in what we see. In other words, you see only so much through a particular, through a particular telescope. Um, so so the, the, the value of religions is that they help us see something, and that's their claim, but they also limit what we can see. They're never able to see everything. And so, I mean, kind of a logical conclusion, to see more of the universe of truth, we need to borrow each other's telescopes. You have a Buddhist telescope, I have a Christian telescope. Let's, uh, excuse me for extending the metaphor here, let's swap telescopes. Let me look through your Buddhist telescope to see things that I cannot see with my Christian telescope. So the, the first value, and I would say need, if we want to deepen our understanding of truth, especially in its if I may put it this way, in its ultimacy, we need to talk to other people about their experiences. God, to use a Christian term, is too big to fit into any one religion, too big for any one telescope. Um, whoops, I just, are you still there? Okay. We're still here, Paul. We're still here, okay, I just, uh, um, so um, let me just get back in here. I'm so, but a second reason is for world peace. Now, this I'll just mention. Maybe we can talk a little bit of, of, about it. But right now, I don't think I, that it, it is at all difficult to make the case that religion plays a role in some of the violence and tensions and animosity that is going on in the world today. And I'm not just talking about Islam, please. Um, I mean, you look at Sri Lanka, you look at, at, at Myanmar, um, you look even also at India um, to see how religion is at the root of so much of the, how religion is used to either justify or even to foster um, violence and, and conflict. And the simple uh, statement here, which I draw from Jonathan Sachs, um, the rabbi in, in England, if religions are part of the problem, and they are, they have to be part of the solution. We need, we need to engage religions to do something about the way they are being used, you might not want to say exploited, you know, to promote tensions and violence and superiority. Um, so, and, and that is why, I'm just going to mention this, um, and that is why in, in a number of universities in the United States and in, 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 in Europe, um, in Germany, at the University of Münster, for instance, um, in, in Germany, there are there are programs or even departments of what is called comparative or re interreligious uh, theology, and they're using the word theology. Um, namely, these are these are pro academic programs that theological academic pro programs, which are based on the premise that. In order to understand one's own religious tradition, you have to bring it into a conversation with or a comparative relationship with another very different religion. Um, you, to, to, as the old, the old saying from Max Muller from, from a century ago, to know one is to know none. To know your own, you have to know, to know another. Or as, a, as one of my mentors, Raymond Panikar put it, to ask, answer the question, uh, who, is, who is God for me? I have to ask you the question, who is God for you? Um, so these, the value, and I would claim even this, the necessity today of 
of interreligious dialogue. But there are different kinds of, of interreligious dialogue. Um, and just to go through them, through them, them briefly, there is what is generally understood to be the dialogue of study. And this is, this is basically where you, you compare doctrines, you compare teachings. You know, what is the, what is the Christian understanding of, the, of, the ultimate, of ultimate reality? What is the Hindu understanding of ultimate reality? What is the Buddhist understanding of the self? What is the Jewish understanding of the self? And you're comparing teachings and there, it's rich. It's very, very rich. Um, but that's not the dialogue we're going to, to be conducting uh, t tonight. I mean, the dialogue of study is what many of, of what all of you are doing, I think, in one form or another. There is the dialogue of experience. And this is what we're talking about today. This is the dialogue in which people from various traditions come together to explore their, their own spirituality. Not just their teachings, but their spirituality, their religious practices. I mean, how they come or how they think they come to an experience of Allah or of, 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 of Rahman or, 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 or of God or of Yahweh. Um, the, the, it's, it's more of, this is where, where we talk about the dialogue of contemplatives. Um, um, okay, and then well, I'm having trouble with my computer here. One second, because I'm, I'm losing the screen on my, on my own. Okay, just one moment. I'm not sure what I did, but I can't get my... Does it work for you to use your arrows or to... I just tried the arrows. Let me just okay. see here um, so I can get into PowerPoint. Okay, there we go. Or the dialogue of collaboration. And this is, this is another where religions come together, not, not to talk about their teachings, not to talk about their religious experiences, but to talk about what are common problems, how can we cooperate today to face, for instance, the environmental, the environmental uh, uh, realities uh, that, and the threat of, 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 of environmental disaster that we're facing today. So these are the various kinds of, 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 of dialogue. But as I said, ours tonight is going to be the dialogue of experience. And this means we're going to be talking about, we're going to be talking about the um, what you find in, um, in all of the religions, namely mystics. Um, and I hope that is not a off-putting word, um, but mystics are those people within each tradition and you can find them in all the traditions I would claim. Um, and what they do is they try, the mystics are trying to carry on what they consider the foundational experience of their founders. What happened in the cave when Muhammad had his experience? What happened to Jesus out in the desert? What happened to Buddha under the Bodhi tree? Um, these experience, what happened to Paul when he was knocked off his horse in, in Christian tradition? Um, to carry on the experience that these original mystics, um, and in this case, all of them are men, because we just men wrote the history of these religions, and they, and we're, and they're all them, there, there were certainly and there are in each tradition. My God, Teresa of Avila, um, um, for instance, there are women mystics as well. But mystics stress the necessity of experience in order to affirm belief. Um, so yes, doctrine and teachings are, I think, are necessary. But there is an experience. Every doctrine is meant to be an expression of or a, an invitation to a religious experience. And if it's not doing that, it's lost its reason to be. Um, and so mystics are those, or contemplatives, are those people who are faithful to their tradition. There are Christian mystics, there are Muslim mystics called Sufis. The Buddhist mystics, most Buddhists, the very de definition of Buddhism is to be a mystic, but they're faithful to their tradition. They wanna be faithful to what was revealed 
in what, what, what was discovered, you know, in the desert un, under Moses and, Abra and later Abraham, um, uh, Abraham and then later Moses. Um, um, but they're also free from their religious tradition. They're free to criticize it. They're free to put it aside. There's an um, amazing fidelity and an amazing freedom that we see in, in the mystics um, of our, of our uh, re religious traditions. Um, so now I'd like to and, and just to, to speak, and I hope this will be meaningful for you or helpful, what I think are common characteristics of contemplative experience. Now this is dangerous. Nowadays in our postmodern world, you're not supposed to talk about commonalities at all. It's all particular studies and, but I, I'm going to, I, I'm old enough <laughs> and maybe uh, um, silly enough, you know, to be, to, to, to venture out and what I think in, in, in my years of study and in, in conversation with pre people from other religions are some of the common characteristics of what you would call contemplative, contemplative experience. And the first is that for them, and I'm using the word ultimate. I don't know what other word to, to use for, I mean, the Christian word is, is, is God, um, but God comes with such freighted baggage, uh, so much of that, that I'm kind of trying to avoid it, but the, the, the ultimate, that whatever the ultimate reality is, it is imminent. Um, in other words, it's not out there for mystics. It's right here. It's part of our very reality right now. It, I'm using the word, it has its existence right here in who we are and in what the world is. There's an, there's an, an, an if I may use a philosophical term, um, there is a non-dual relationship between the ultimate and the finite. They, they co-inhere, they, ex they exist in each other. Um, so this notion of, 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 of the ultimate as, as radically imminent, present here. But also mystics talk about in a mystical experience, you come to realize, you come to understand yourself differently. True self, that's a term that some mystics use, both Buddhist and Christian. Namely, your sense of self is expanded beyond your individuality. Somehow your being is no longer just your being, um, but it, 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 it is a, it, it is, um, excuse me, just, it, it is a sense of, of what I really am consists of what you really are. And so that my, my, my I, is somehow part of a reality that connects me with you and with everything else. Um, so it's a movement beyond self-centeredness, beyond pre preoccupation with just yourself. It's an expansion of, of, of yourself. Um, but it's also an experience the mystics say, and this is very common to all of them, that it's beyond, it's beyond words, be, beyond thought. It's an experience that, that you simply cannot put into words. Um, um, and so it's, there's a need there for the missing, the way I put it, the need to shut up in order to wake up. The need just to stop our usual way of thinking in order to open ourselves to the, to the possibility of, of experiencing reality differently. So contemplatives discover another way of knowing beyond the intellect, beyond discursive thought. It doesn't say it, the intellect and discursive thought is not worth it, of course not. But there are other ways of knowing, very real other ways of knowing. Um, and so th this, this, this stress on, on and we're, this is going to be very much a part of our, of our exercise this evening. But if I would then try to describe what happens to a man or a woman when they begin to practice, in some way successfully practice contemplative, con a contemplative practice uh, or a mystical practice, what happens to them? 
And I venture, this is more my own thinking. I, 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 when, well, all that went before I can substantiate with footnotes, but this is kind of the way I would put it. I think two things. You see that the, the, the man or the woman, the, the, the contemplative becomes grounded in peace personally. In other words, it's hard to, they, they attain a, a, a sense of, of, of groundedness of, of, that gives them peace, that gives them the resources to deal with whatever, whatever have, they have to deal with. Um, they're, they're, they're grounded. But at the same time, interpersonally, they're connected with others in compassion. There, there, there comes about a genuine, spontaneous, natural caring for others, or as the Buddhists put it, for all sentient beings, or as, for, for all living beings, for, 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 for that which is other. So a groundedness in peace and a connectedness in compassion or care. Um, so this is in general. But we're going to be looking at tonight. We're going to be exploring, experimenting. That's what we're doing. It's an experimentation with with Buddhism, and and just a couple of words. That, and I, I presume, I imagine that many, if not all of you, you know, have done some study of Buddhism. But let me just make a couple of comments about Buddhism that I hope will be helpful and and um, that you might agree with, or if you don't, we'll talk about it. But Buddhism is a non-theistic religion. It does not talk about God. But that doesn't mean that it is an atheistic religion. It just, I mean, it, it doesn't want to talk about, uh, about God. Um, so it, which, in other words, the ultimate for, the, for Buddhism, and this is true of, of, I think, of the different forms of Buddhism, whether it's you know, Theravada or Mahayana or Vajrayana, but for, for the Buddhists, the ultimate it is not a thing. It's not a being. Not a person. But rather, it's a, and I'm just you. It's it's a presence. Um, it's 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 an activity. Um, um, and my Buddhist teacher, Lama John McCransky, talks about it as as ultimate as an energy, um, <laughs> the force. Yeah. Um, but some. <laughs> But something along those lines, I mean, translated into Christian language, it would mean that God is not a noun, but a verb, an activity, not an entity. Um, now, just what that means, how to unpack that um, would be <laughs> that that's the stuff of interreligious dialogue and, and one's own experience of dialogue. So, but for the, for so Buddhism though, when they 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 when Buddhists try to refer though to to what is ultimate, there there's an abundance of words. These are some of the words that they may ring some bells for you in your own study of Buddhism, perhaps. But Buddhism it's also referred sometimes as shunyata, or emptiness. And emptiness means means that it's a, it's a reality that does not have an individual identification, but it is the interconnectedness of everything, the interconnectedness of everything, shunyata, empty, emptiness. Um, also in the Tibetan tradition, it's called the nature of mind. Um, or this, this one you perhaps have encountered in your studies, it's called our Buddha nature, the nature of everything. Um, uh, so it's, it's or one also in Tibet, it's they use the term spaciousness. It, the ultimate is is it's the space that surrounds and holds us, like the space that surrounds and holds us. So um, this is Buddhism, kind of in general, but the form, the form of Buddhist practice that I would like to experiment with you this evening um, is taken from Tibetan Buddhism or Vajrayana Buddhism. And here I'd like to just give you a little bit of background to, to, to Tibetan Buddhism. I like to call 
Tibetan Buddhism is, is in my Christian terminology, I'm a Christian theologian, so I, I can't avoid some of these words. It's a sacramental form of Buddhism. In other words, it works with feelings, with, with images, <laughs> smells and bells. You know, you, you walk into a Tibetan monastery, how different it is from a, from a, 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 a Zen, a, a, a Zendo which is very stark and whereas there's colors there's mandalas there's there there there's there's sounds it's, it's so it's i call it a sacramental form of buddhism but this is that this is the starting point i call it the hypothesis of tibetan forms of, of tibetan buddhism which rings true with others too but this is the their way of putting it in the depths of our awareness of our own of our of our own personal uh, uh, awareness in, in the depths of that there is an innate source of compassion warmth and safety innate a source i mean these are my, the words don't do justice of course but it's that, that there is a, a, a deeper resource in our own awareness is called, they call it our Buddha nature. Every single human being, even, even animals, but it, human beings in different ways has a Buddha nature. It's really our human nature. It's what we really are. But we're out of touch with it. We've lost touch with it. Um, or when we do, well, we, 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 need to, we need to be reminded of it. I keep touching. Um, one second here. Okay. So we need access points to our Buddha nature. Access points. How to, how to get, get at it. And these, and the, in the practice that we're going to be using tonight, they're called caring moments in our lives, um, moments when, when others have shown us love or when we have found ourselves loving others. I mean, these are very real moments in, 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 in the lives of each of us. And admittedly, some of us have more of these moments than, 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 than others. But the sense is that try to find such moments of of, of being cared for or of just feeling relaxed with. These moments are usually human beings that provide this care, but they can also be pets. I mean, your, your, your dog, your cat, or places, just a place in nature where you can sit and you feel at ease. You feel there. Or they can be spiritual figures. If you are a Christian or a, or a Hindu, it could be Krishna, it could be Buddha, it could be Jesus, or more, it could be da the Dalai Lama, or maybe Bishop Tutu, but people who kind of embody this kind of, 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 of care. Um, so in, in Tibetan Buddhism, um, the imagination plays a central role. Um, and this is where it's different from Zen certainly different from, from um, Vipassana or insight meditation, if you're familiar with that. Um, they work with visualization. So our, our, our meditation this evening is going to be a guided meditation. It's not just going to be pure silence, um, uh, although we will have silence, of course. Um, and, and yet, while the Tibetans work with visualizations, these visualizing these caring moments, there always comes the moment when you let it all go. You let the imaging go and you just stay in a conceptual, non-thinking awareness, open awareness. I mean, so you build, you have the image, it's like a Tibetan a uh, 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 mandala made out of, you've seen that perhaps, Tibetan monks, they very carefully craft these beautiful sand mandalas um, um, using their imagination, and then they sweep it away. They let it go. That's an integral part 
of Tibetan meditation. So that is where we're at. Um, I'm going to stop our screen sharing. And I would like to now go into the practice. We're going to 715, is that correct? Yeah, okay. So just very briefly, and that's all we can do, is I'd like to do a little form of meditation with you th this evening for about, I'd say about maybe 10 minutes, okay? Or maybe a little bit more. So um, in this moment, in this meditation rather, and just by way of, of introduction, as I said, you're gonna be asked to try to recall a caring moment in your life. And again, just to try to give you an idea, this is a moment with another being, doesn't have to be human, uh, but with another being that brings you joy when you remember it, or you feel heart warmed to recall it. A moment when somebody was just happy to be with you, when that's how you felt, or when someone was seeing you in your deep work, or when someone, someone was listening, or when someone was just kind of radiating warmth with you or rooting for you, or just wishing you well. It, it can be a very particular moment or it can be just a passing moment, you know, where, where, where you, you met someone and you felt they really cared for you. Um, for me, just to give you that, caring moments are with, are with the mother of my best friend when I was growing up as a little kid on the Southwest side of Chicago, Mrs. Polinzi, the mother of my best friend. She lived across the street and I knew whenever I went over to visit Billy, my friend, and his mother there was there, Mrs. Polinzi, she loved me. I just felt so cared for by her. Oh, especially when she made a, a dinner, that she made the pasta that my Polish mother never knew how to make. And we just gathered around that table and I knew I was, I recall that's a caring moment for me. Um, so something, something similar to that. Um, in your own life. So try to recall one before we start. Okay. So I'm going to um, ask you all now in your, in your, um, at your desk or your, your chair, your couch, just to sit in a comfortable position with, um, with your back straight. That's kind of important to have your back straight. Um, you can hold your hands you know, on your lap or a zen or, or on, on your upper legs. Um, um, and Tibetan Buddhists suggest that you keep your eyes open um, or just kind of cast down in front of you. I mean, you're looking at your screen, maybe at, at your screen or if you wanna turn off your screen, but just that, but you keep your eyes open. If you're not comfortable with that, then, then, then please shut them. The, the idea is that you're, you're um, you, you, you want to be, be comfortable uh, while you're doing it. So let's just kind of get in our position. I'm going to ring the meditation bell. I hope it comes through um, okay on the, on the computer. Um, and then we're going to, to begin. So just let the sound of the bell quiet you down. Just let yourself kind of just resonate with the sound of the bell. So we're going to begin with some cleansing breaths. So just breathe in through your nose, deep so that your tummy expands a bit, hold the breath, and then gently exhale it through your mouth, just to kind of clean yourself out. So let's just do the breathe in through your nose, feel your tummy, your stomach expand a bit, hold the breath, and let it out gently. Just do that a couple of times on your own.
Now be aware of your body. Just relax into your body. Where you're seated, the firmness of the chair, the couch, the, your feet on the ground. And if there are any places of tension in your body, just let them, let them relax. Just be one with your body. Be your body. Let your body do the knowing. Now be aware of your breath. Just let your breath take its natural rhythm. Easy inhale, easy exhale. Right now do nothing else but breathe. Let your breathing be you. And now be aware of any thoughts that may be in your mind or feelings. Just be aware of them. Look at them and then let them go. Just let them pass on. Like clouds in the sky. Let them pass by. So that all you are doing is looking at the sky. And now bring to mind your caring moment. And imagine that moment to be taking place right now, right here. You are with that person or in that situation. It's happening right now. And let yourself accept the love that is being shown to you. Let it go enter into your whole being. Your body, your mind, your heart. Cared for. Love. held.
in this moment, someone is seeing you for who you really are. Beyond what you or others may think of yourself. They see you. Just accept their care, their love. Let yourself feel it. If your mind starts to wander, just let that caring moment draw you back to itself like a magnet. And now let the images of your caring moment go. Just let them go. And relax into the sense of warmth, into the sense of love and safety that you felt from them. Just abide in that warmth and that love. Don't think about it, feel it, rest in it. Let yourself rest in this sense of being held in love and warmth. what your caring moment enabled you to feel and sense is what is always there, always available in the depths of your own awareness.
It's always there. Let yourself rest in it. Let it hold you. Trust it. Abide and relax in this compassionate, spacious awareness. Thank you all very much for your willingness or patience to try something which may be a little bit new for, for many of you. But this is the practice that, uh, that my wife and I uh, have oh now for 10, 12 years um, practiced in and that we uh, we, we teach uh, twice a month uh, here in our home in, in Madison to a little, a little Sangha. Um, sangha is a little a meditation community, uh, a Tibetan form of practice. And there are other forms. If you had a chance to read that chapter of, of, of my book, there are many different kinds of Buddhist meditation. Of course, this is just one of them. So, uh, David and Uli, um, I just will open it up for, uh, I'll maybe turn it over to you to get, move us into the next phase of conversation or, or whatever you wanted to be the next step. Well, I think we should open it up to the fellows, um, their responses, their experience, impression, if they wanna talk about anything or if they um, have questions but i i'd like to open it up and really have uh, give the the fellows a chance if yeah. they want to share something yeah both i mean whether you might have had questions about some of the introductory um, remark the little lecture there or questions about the meditation practice itself what what whatever just um and um you try to be brief with your questions. I'll try to be brief in my answers so we can hear from as many of you as, uh, as would like to speak.
So I guess uh, just raise your hand or speak up or whatever your process is. Mm -hmm. I had a question. Why, why was there an emphasis on keeping our eyes open? When, when I meditate, usually I think of closing your eyes. Why, yeah. why keep them open? Yeah. No. Very good question, Ethan. It's and this is um, in in at least in Tibetan forms. The idea is um, when we're to stress, when we are meditating, we are not um, withdrawing from the world. Meditation is not an escape from from the world. Um, it, it's meant to it's meant to provide us with what we need to really embrace love life in as compassionate and wise a way as possible. So it's 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 that's the the main reason, namely to re be a reminder that my meditation uh, is right taking place right here in in the world around me. Um, also, it helps. Um, Keep it from falling asleep if you put your close your eyes to it. Very practical, but that's that's the that's the main reason, Ethan. I don't know. Does that make sense to, to you and your? Um... Um, yeah, I, I mean it makes sense. I, it's just different from the way. I... Oh yeah, and, and and again, this instruction is: if you're not comfortable with it, then then close your eyes. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, Maya. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you for that. That was really something I felt super tired all day and I feel like I have energy for the first time. So oh. something went right. Um, and I also wanted to say thanks for emphasizing the fact that your mind does not have to be completely blank, but bringing in like the clouds in the sky metaphor, because I was always under the impression that you were supposed to like think about nothing and I didn't know how to do that. And so I felt like meditation wasn't something I could reach or do. And this just made it a lot more accessible. So mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That's that. That's um um. Th there's a difference they say between um. The goal of the goal of meditation is not thinking. It, it is not not thinking. <laughs> it is non-thinking. In other words, thoughts are going to come, but the idea of meditation is that you don't grasp on them. You don't hold them. In fact, you use them. You use them, you know, to say, ah, I'm thinking of that. Now I'm going to let it go. Um, but of course, in this particular Tibetan form of, of, of practice, as you saw, we start with thoughts, the caring moment, the image of the caring moment. And we see where that leads us, what that opens up for us. But then we let it go. And you just abide. They say a conceptual abiding. No, um, no thought abiding in that sense of <laughs> of, of warmth, of, of, of safety, of, 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 of goodness. Mm -hmm. I really liked the the kind of the part that um, was brought in kind of like the feeling you feel when you feel, you know, this, this moment is like, like, that's the way you are. And like, it's like the way, like, it's, it's like a truth, I guess, for lack of a better word, like an innate truth. I feel like a lot of other like meditations or, or practices kind of emphasize like that becoming like the goal. Like it's, it's not something that, that you are, right now that's being like masked from you but it's something to to reach so i don't know i think that's that's a really like comforting um and, and a really cool perspective i hadn't been exposed to before mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. well have you done other forms of meditation jacob or uh... not like religiously for lack of better word yeah, like not yeah, not yeah, frequently right. um yeah. but mm -hmm. like you know for for uh various presentations or stuff like that so yeah Mm -hmm, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In, in the in this Tibetan practice, what they what spoke to me because I started out my practice of Buddhism with Zen, um, in a Zen practice, Zen Buddhist practice. Um, but what 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 attracted me um, in Tibetan practice? <laughs> maybe it's because Tibetan has smells and bells, and I was brought up Catholic, and we have incense and candles and all that. So maybe it was speaking to kind of my preconditioning. Probably, probably. Um, 
but but it was what 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 spoke to me. It was that it gave you it gives you a very something very real in your life, namely a moment when someone loved me, um, or a moment when I felt cared for. And then they see, and that feeling or that awareness, um, it's a real, it's a real experience. You know, it's, it's, uh, you're not just so believe that that it is so, no, experience it, feel it. And then comes the, and then the, the suggestion is what you're feeling, what that, what, you know, Mrs. Polinzi enabled me to feel, you know, my, my caring moment. That's what is always there. That's what is present in the depths of our, of our own awareness. We can reach that. It's there. All the, now you may might say, how the hell do you know it's there? Try it. That's, that's, you're not asked to believe it, you know, on faith. Try it. Just let yourself abide in such moments and see how it affects you. Um, and so it's it's a kind of uh, <laughs> it's kind of empirical, you know. You're you're what to do? You're working with 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 real experiences, you know. And I was brought up. You just believe it because because the Pope said so, you know. Um, this is and, and of course that was that was the whole thrust of Buddha's teaching, you know. You have to experience it yourself. Mm -hmm. Anyway, that was not an answer. I just used you to. to to, to rip on something. <laughs> when you were talking about like going back to this practice for like so long, like 10, 12 years, do you like usually go back to like the same moments to like create this feeling or do you like think of like other things? Oh yeah, no, I, 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 I do use other, um, other in other examples of caring moments besides it yeah or you know an, another a caring moment um can also be you know where you you feel love how natural it is to to feel love is when you find yourself feeling love and compassion for someone else when you can kind of when you have no cho choice but to, you know, to care about someone. Um, I mean, and I'm not talking about, you know, a, a, a romantic moment, you know, with a very significant other. I don't want to exclude that, of course not. But I'm just talking about, I mean, when, when you know, when you see images of refugees, um, when you see images of, of people, you know, victims of war, and your, your heart goes out to them. That's that's it. That's what we're talking about. That spontaneous ca capacity to to give or to receive love. That's what's at the depth of our awareness. That's our true human nature. Call it Buddha nature. Call it Christ nature. Call it nature of Krishna. But th that's who we are. That that the, the capacity to give to give love and to receive love. Um, that's that capacity. Is real. It's mysterious. I, I, I don't want to call it a god or anything, but it's 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 real, in in, in our own depths. And 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 the Buddhist it, it it's not again as I said earlier. It's not that you have to you have to believe it, but take it as what I said in my notes. Take it as a hypothesis and see it and check it out. See if through these practices, you, you, it it can bring about a, an awareness, a sense. Of, of things that you didn't, you normally were not aware of. Mm -hmm. I have a question. Sure. Um, well, so um, who, say, oh yeah, good. Simran. Mm -hmm. um, you say that you do this, you share this um, experience with the Sangha. Um, do you share this uh, experience with other groups of people? Have you done workshops where you uh, have a diverse group of participants? Is this something that you normally do? Oh, uh, if, if I'm getting the gist of your, your question, Simran, 
uh, yes, I have um, had uh, just lovely experiences in in exploring this with um, with with uh, Christian communities. Um, you know, using proposing this kind of Buddhist a Buddhist practice, such as we did this evening, you know, for for Christians, and and asking in asking them, helping them, suggesting to them how this might fit into their to their to their Christian practice. This is this is why I particularly like this um, this type of Buddhism. Um, Kathy and I, my wife and I, are um, are teachers in a uh, a group called the Foundation for Active Compassion. Um, it's located in in Boston. Our teacher is is Lama John McCransky. Um, but our foundation is uh, it, it, we're identified as part of our mission is to to present these teachings in a way in which they might be meaningful for people of any religious background um, or for people of no religious background. Um, and so it's it's very interreligious and uh, interfaith, or, or in, inter <laughs> also as a interideological too. Mm -hmm. did, did, is that did I answer your question, or is that what you were? Yeah, no, I was just wondering what like if you've ever gone to a different temple, if you've gone to um, like a masjid, if you've gone to a gurdwara, if you've gone to a mandir, or. Um, uh, what is the term for a Jewish temple? Or like a synagogue or a, a synagogue? A, a, yeah. Have you mm -hmm. gone to these? Oh, with synagogue, yes, yes. With I've done it with with with. Uh, well, it wasn't a synagogue; it was a Jewish seminary, um, you know, in Philadelphia, um, where where I, I taught. But I have, um, you know, I have done it not with communities, but I've been on on panels. You know, with with Hindu scholars and practitioners, with with Muslim, with 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 uh, Christian and Jewish, and we've talked about this kind of uh, inter, you know, in, in, inter spiritual way of going about interreligious dialogue. Um, but I'd um, I'd love to do it, you know, in a namaste and in, in, with a with a mu Muslim community. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, no, I just thought it was very interesting because um, in Sikhism, you know, we de we feel like there is a lot of mysticism um, that I guess becomes part of our meditation. So uh -huh. I just thought it was very, um, this is something that I feel like I do a lot all the time and I didn't know that it was, um, uh -huh. it had that, that kind of terminology yeah, or yeah. the way that you're teaching it. Mm -hmm. but, um, I guess I was just curious about that. Yeah. Wow. I mean, you don't have to, I'd love to hear more about the, your experience in that way from with, with Hmong Sikhs. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I had a, a question. Um, is the caring moment within the Tibetan tradition, is the caring moment like a thing of value or is it just a mode to sort of attain a feeling? Because you talked about like keeping this feeling from that caring moment, but it is the moment itself of value, or is it just sort of a means to attain that? Does that make sense? Or I think I I think uh, uh, I I think it I think I get what you're saying, Ethan. Um, just by the way, the expression "caring moment" that's a term that our Buddhist teacher. This Lama John McCransky, um, who grew up Jewish, by the way, um, um, uh, that's a term that he's used to translate the Tibetan terms into language that, you know, uh, Westerners, Americans, Europeans can understand. Um, in in the Tibetan practice, it's it's more they're working with they're working with with bodhisattvas, um, and, and they're 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 working with what what is called a guru yoga. Um, um, but but to your question, um, their value is relative. They, 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 these caring moments, uh, they're, 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 they do have a value, but it's a relative value. The ideal is to come to that experience 
where you just, it's kind of this con a conceptual, more than discursive experience of, of where you, you, you feel yourself, again, connected. You feel yourself part of, you, you, you feel yourself held um, in ways in which it's beyond, that's, that's, that's the goal. That, that what is called this non-dual experience where, you know, um, for me, it's, it's expressed if you allow me in, in a Christian term taken from the New Testament, when St. Paul in his letter to the Galatians says, it's not I that live, it's Christ who's living. You know, his, it's no longer he, it, it's Christ, but it is, it's he, Christ, it's, it's that version of yourself with a larger self. It's non-dual, they're, they're, no, they're not two, but they're not one, they're not one. You see, it's, it's that fusion where each gives life to the other, that experience. I think uh, that will be our last Q&A for tonight. Um, yeah, I wanna thank everybody for being here. Uh, yeah, let's, thank let's thank Paul together for that, for that oh. great talk and meditation. Thank you very much. It was great being with you. A real privilege. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, th this could be stuff we engage more in the spring. I know I had one question about that in the poll. And I mean, I know it's, it's part of a lot of things, even if we're not engaging it head on. So I hope that this is something that we can continue to kind of think about or um, yeah, if this, if this struck you, please, yeah, let us know. But with that, this is, like I said, our last meeting for the semester. So um, stay tuned for, for emails in the future, for blog posts. Um, it's possible that we'll be able to put something together, maybe some small uh, extra session before the semester starts. It's a little ways off yet. But uh, until then, uh, wishing you the best of luck on finals. Um, blessed holiday for those that are celebrating holidays. A happy New Year. Um, safety and peace for all your families in the next month. Be safe, everyone. Yeah. Okay. Bye, all. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Bye. Take care. Bye. -bye.